This summer, you're invited to a magical place where weird is celebrated, strange is special, and beauty is more than meets the eye. Good morning, Uglyville! Hello, gorgeous. Let's check out how you look today. Short and stubby, nubby teeth out on full display. Your pinkish red got this thing on your head, and whoa. Girl, you couldn't look better. I have a feeling we're not in Uglyville anymore. Inspired by the plush toy brand of the same name, Ugly Dolls is a new musical animated feature with a voice cast led by Kelly Clarkson, Nick Jonas, Janelle Monet, Blake Shelton, and Pitbull. The story, which celebrates diversity and friendship, follows Moxie, an optimistic ugly doll voiced by Kelly Clarkson, whose curiosity about the world leads her and her friends from their home in Uglyville to another town known as Perfection, where the dolls are trained. Here, the ugly dolls are manipulated by Lou, voiced by Nick Jonas, who is in charge of the dolls' training program. Veteran animation director Kelly Asbury helmed the film and joins us today. I'm Carolyn Giardina. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. Kelly is an animation film director, screenwriter, voice actor, children's book author and illustrator, and nonfiction writer. He's best known for directing Shrek 2 and Nomeo and Juliet. A native of Beaumont, Texas, who came to Los Angeles to study at CalArts, Asbury's early career at Walt Disney Feature Animation included The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. He was an assistant art director on Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas and provided storyboards for films from Toy Story to Frozen. His directing credits include the Academy Award-nominated films Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, and Shrek 2. He also directed Nomeo and Juliet, for which he was nominated for Annie Awards in both writing and directing. Kelly, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Oh, happy to be here. Tell us about the origin of this movie. Well, to the best of my knowledge, because I came a little bit later in the process, I think it was probably about 18 years ago, the creators, David Horvath and his wife, Sun Yim Kim, I think that's how you pronounce it, I could be wrong. <laughs> they had a long distance relationship and David would draw these little creatures on post-its and send them to her with little sayings on them. And she, I guess, made a doll out of one of them. And I suppose from there, he just found a way to get them franchised or, or get them manufactured. And they turned into something that no one could have predicted. So they were a big phenomenon and kind of a cult. And that's been several years ago. But one day, someone from SDX called my attorney and said, we'd like to talk to Kelly about coming on this movie. And I didn't know a lot about the ugly dolls. I didn't have children during the time that these dolls were really in play more. So I had to learn a lot about them. And so I did my homework, went to the interview, talked about them, and they showed me some work that had already been done on the story, which actually Robert... Which, Rod which was written by Robert Rodriguez. Right. Yeah, the original story for it was written by Robert Rodriguez. And he was going to be producer on the film. But I guess they were looking for someone to make it and direct it. And it was being done at Real Effects in Dallas, Texas. And they also have a studio in Montreal. So they called me in and they showed me the story and I read the script. And what I loved was the very beginning of the film was the song that still exists in the movie, which is Couldn't Be Better. And then the ending of the film, which I won't disclose, but the very ending was always there. And I sort of said, look, that's a great beginning and it's a tremendous ending. And I said, the stuff in between could be fun. How are we gonna get from there to there? That's the work that needed to be done. And so along with head of story, Paul McAvoy and Allison Peck wrote the screenplay. She worked closely with us. We all sort of put our heads together, the story team. Everyone you know, worked really hard together. That was one thing about this movie we didn't have the normal amount of time to make it. We didn't have the normal five years it takes to make an animated feature. When did you come on? I came on about a year and a half before it actually was finished, which is usually about the time when a movie kicks into gear in animation. Usually that time is spent prior to story development and revisions. And So the bulk of the movie was made in 18 months? Then? The bulk of it was made in 18 months. Now, one of the things that you wanted to do with it is make it a musical. Yes. One of the things that 
came up when I was looking at the story was we have this great song in the beginning. I knew the composer, Chris Leonard's. We'd worked together before on Smurfs, The Lost Village a couple of years earlier. And he and I had been talking about, wouldn't it be great to do a musical, animated feature, but full on musical. And he was doing the music for this. And I heard that Glenn Slater, whose work I'd seen before, was the lyricist. And I said, you know, songs can really help a story be told. And this movie had a lot of rules about it. There's a lot of rules of the world. And there's a lot of inner dialogue for characters. And I didn't want to do a bunch of talking scenes. I didn't want a lot of dialogue in the movie. I wanted the dialogue to be saved for laughs and, and let's get some good lines in there. But let characters sing about what they're thinking and then we can make those moments entertaining. And that's what a musical sort of buys for you. It buys exposition that the audience is enjoying and listening to. Well, our lead ugly doll is Moxie, who's voiced by Kelly Clarkson. Yes. How did she come onto the project? And this was her first lead role in an animated film. Right. Our music supervisor, Jason Markey, we were looking for the lead and all sorts of names were being brought up, but nobody quite seemed to be, you know, Moxie, the character, this brave, confident, probably overconfident, bubbly, exuberant personality. And then Jason Markey said, what about Kelly Clarkson? And at first everyone was, wow, can she act? Can she do it? And I said, you know, she's really talented and we can work with her. You know, the beautiful thing about voiceover work is if you do have someone that's not necessarily a trained actor, it's voiceover. You can work with them. You can really work with them in a way that you get the performance you want. And I said, let's just, let's give it a try, you know? So very quickly, she heard about the story and she came in. She met with our producer, Orna Aviv, who really pitches the story very well. And she got interested and she said she'd do it. She came in to the first recording session. She read the script and she just asked me immediately, did you guys write this for me? Is this supposed to be me? And I said, no, it's just you accidentally. But she really is Moxie. She was able to step into that character and just bring herself into the role. And Moxie is the character that really takes all of them on this journey. Oh, Moxie is a character in the film who firmly believes and will not let go of the belief that every doll, no matter what kind of doll they are, belongs to a child somewhere out there. There's a child for every doll. She sings about it. There's a child for every doll And a doll for every child who knows just how they're chosen? The story seldom say it could happen any moment, and today could be the day. And her goal in the story is to find her child. In the meantime, in the town of Uglyville, which is all the supposed ugly dolls, so Moxie gathers her friends together and against all of their better judgment, particularly Ox, who's the mayor voiced by Blake okay. Shelton, her partner on the voice. And Ox is, if there's a father figure in this story, it's Ox. And he is trying to keep the ugly dolls happy at all times. There's a secret that he's got about Uglyville that we'll, you'll learn about in the movie. And I can't give it away. That's why the movie is there's a lot of things I don't want to give away because it's important, but he doesn't want anyone to go on any journeys looking for their children. He treats it as if it's a fairy tale. And Moxie and her friends decide they're going to go on this journey. They find a secret passage they don't know about. They don't know where it leads. And they end up at this place called the Institute of Perfection, where another type of doll, which they call themselves pretty dolls, they're these perfect little not quite Barbie doll, not quite brats, but sort of a hybrid that sort of, they're all the same shape. They all look alike. They have maybe five different varieties of hair color, different skin tones, but they're just mix and match, but they're all essentially the same doll, manufactured and perfect. And the ugly dolls don't belong in this place. And that's when they meet Lou, who is voiced by Nick Jonas. And Lou tells them, I'm the guy that sort of judges who's pretty and who's not around here. And you guys are definitely ugly. And he dissuades them until it wants them out of there. Now, Lou has a few secrets himself. 
that we'll learn about, and that leads to his undoing as a villain. But in the meantime, he's making it as difficult for these ugly dolls as possible. And the big question in the movie is, even though they've gotten as close as they can get to crossing over into this other world of humans and meeting children, how are they going to get past Lou? How are they going to get past the rules of this world called perfection? And that's really the driving force behind the movie is, how is Moxie going to get what she wants? Because everything that can happen to get in her way all the way to the last minute of the movie happens. And, you know, I love stories where the stakes continue to mount as you go. That's the story in a nutshell. Let's talk about some of the songs in the movie. You mentioned Lou. This is when we meet him. Nick Jonas performs a big musical number right. called The Ugly Truth, Yes, where we meet him and he shares his goals for the dolls. Right. Well, Lou is a guy that has a secret. He has something that he knows about himself and he's trying to cover it up to the point where he holds himself as the example of a perfect doll and no one can live up to his standards. He is the gold standard and he's decreed that as time has passed. Lewis sort of created a little bit of a kingdom for himself. He performs this song whenever a new group of dolls is brought into the Institute. And it's called The Ugly Truth, where he explains that it's not going to be easy here, that I will decide if you're right or wrong, or I'll decide if you're ugly or pretty. And he is looking at these dolls that have nothing wrong with them, and he's pointing out the tiniest flaws and telling them, oh, you got to work on that, you got to work on that. So Lou isn't a very nice guy from the very minute you meet him, but he is a comic villain along the way. And his insecurities lead to some really great, funny moments of him losing it. There's another song in it, Unbreakable, yes. that Kelly Clarkson sings with Janelle Monae's character. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk about that song, too? Very different okay, style, sure. but really lovely. Well, Janelle Monae plays a character named Mandy in the story, and Mandy is a perfect doll who also has things about her that she knows are not perfect and she's trying to hide them from Lou for fear that she'll be rejected. And the dolls that get rejected end up in recycling and they have to go back through the process again. So it's a very big deal to be as perfect as you can be. So Mandy, in spite of her misgivings, is trying to play this role. At one point in the story, Moxie reaches her lowest point where Moxie's beginning to wonder if she's going to ever achieve what she wants because Lou has almost won at this point and Mandy goes to Moxie to give her a pep talk and in the process they sing a song number together called Unbreakable in which Mandy is basically saying no one can break you but yourself and don't let anyone tell you otherwise show them who you are show them that you're strong show them they can see It's a really inspirational song. It's really high energy. Real effects helped me. And, and I have to give credit to the story department. I have to give credit to the effects, the layout, everything. This beautiful cacophony of images all centered around mirrors and the running theme of mirrors in this movie. Because what you see is what's more important than what other people see. And, and that's a big message. And that's really what that song is about. And then, while we won't give away the ending, I am going to talk about the ending mm -hmm. song. So, Broken and Beautiful Broken and uh, Beautiful is Kelly Clarkson's final number. And this was actually co-written by Pink. Yes, it was. And Marshmallow did the arranging. So, it's a very different song that comes over the beginning credits at the end of the film. Just as the film concludes, this song kicks in. And it really is what, generally, I think we hope that it's what people leave the theater sort of dancing to because it's a song that is basically saying even if you are broken even if there is 
an obvious flaw or, or visually whatever you want to call broken, that you're still beautiful in your own way. Everyone's got this. It's a very life affirming and self affirming song that you can hear. You know, it seems like something that Kelly Clarkson would almost say to herself every single day, just, you know what? I'm beautiful no matter what. She's just got that attitude and it's a great attitude. And uh, I think if we can rub some of that off onto audiences, particularly kids living in the world we live in right now, where this is all in the forefront, you know, we all just need to be more kind to each other. Let's talk about you a little bit. You're from Beaumont, Texas, originally. Yes. Uh, you went to CalArts, and then, as I understand it, you found a mentor in the legendary Chuck Jones. Yes. My freshman year of CalArts, which was 1980, actually, there was an event at the Academy honoring Mel Blanc, who did all the great voices. And, of course, we were all these animation nerds who all just came to this big event, and we just happened to sit behind, we were on the second row, I think, and we happened to sit behind Chuck Jones and his wife, Marion. And we struck up a conversation with him and he talked to us a little bit. And one of our friends, they exchanged phone numbers and he said, you know what? I'd love to talk to you guys. I love to talk to young people about, you know, animation. And then about a week later, my friend Jeff DeGrandis called me and he said, Chuck Jones called and he wants me to bring a group of people down to Costa Mesa to his house, and he just wants to sit around and talk and talk about animation. And so he asked Rob Minkoff and Chris Bailey and me. Rob Minkoff, the director of Stuart Little and, and Lion King. We all went to school together. Chris Bailey is a animation director now on movies like he's done Hop. He was the animation director. He's done some stuff for Illumination. He was nominated for an Oscar for a Mickey Mouse short that he made some time ago. Jeff DeGrandis went on to be a producer on Dora Explorer and a lot of so, talent in that room. <laughs> yeah, we were, you know, and so we all went down there and Chuck just welcomed us and talked to us about, you know, everything. And it ended up striking up a friendship with all of us. And he became really a mentor and also just sort of like an uncle to us for all of our careers until he passed away. But we were close with Chuck all those years and he was a beacon of reassurance at all times. If there was ever anything that was going wrong, we could call Chuck and say, we're facing this. And he always had a way of telling you, you know, don't worry about the studio executives. I remember he said to me one time, look, these studio executives that are always giving you guys trouble, just wait a few years, they'll be fired and you'll still be working there. He experienced that way back in the thirties and forties with Warner Brothers. He said another thing was, you'll never change this. It's always going to be this way. <laughs> you know, there will never be a day when you walk into a studio and you have absolute creative freedom. He just said, if that's what you're looking for, quit. And so he gave us very realistic advice. So Chuck was great. From a creative standpoint, what about his work do you think inspired you the most? Well, I think his humor, first of all, when you watch What's Opera Doc or One Froggy Evening, or any of the Roadrunner Coyote shorts. They're just as funny. Now, as an adult, I watch them and I laugh probably more. And I understand things more than I did when I was a kid even. I laughed at other things. And I think Chuck was really one of the people who sort of invented the idea of hitting the movie at one level for kids and then hitting it at another level for adults. The appreciation just ran the gambit, you know, between ages. That was a real lesson that I don't think he ever really verbalized, but I think just being around him, you pick that up. And I try to do that in the movies I make is give something for all ages, you know, not just make it for children or I don't, I don't feel like I make my movies for any age group. I just try to make a good one and I hope they are, but that's not up to me to say so. You've seen quite an evolution in the animation industry. You've worked on The Little Mermaid and mm -hmm. Beauty and the Beast, and then you worked on Toy Story. How would you describe the way the animation industry is changing? Well, it's very interesting. I started the business in 1983 at Disney, out of CalArts, and I worked on a movie called The Black Cauldron. It was the first thing I worked on. And there was one, I believe there was one or two shots 
where they did use CG of the cauldron itself, the black cauldron. It's a geometric shape, and they were able to... They did use it to help them with that shot of the cauldron rising out of the ground and these skeletons coming out of it. And that was the first time I ever saw sort of the wireframe computer animation. But I think at that time, most people thought computer animation is going to help us with, you know, vehicles and hard edge surfaces and maybe layout and camera angles can be helped. But we'll never, I remember everyone or most everyone at that time saying, we'll never get the true character animation that people expect from Disney in a CG form. People felt that way for several years. But there was one person back in those days who didn't. And that was this guy that I met in that time. He had gone to CalArts. His name was John Lasseter. And he was sort of really pushing the idea that Disney should be at the forefront of this. They should be doing this. They need to find out and explore all the capabilities that the computer is going to have. And he believed, I don't know if it was this profound a thing as sound moving into motion pictures, but certainly within the animation business, as each film was made that I've worked on, every single film I've made has had a little more CG and a little more and a little more until Toy Story, which I was fortunate enough to work on for about a year as a story artist. That was the first one that was all CG. And I remember thinking, wow, is the public going to accept this in a pure feature form? I know the shorts had been accepted and they had won Academy Awards at Pixar and John Lasseter's vision, he is a visionary and he did see that happening. And I was on the sidelines. I don't think that I was, I'm not one of the pioneers of any of it, but I was able certainly to stand on the shoulders of all the people that did over the years create and learn and this technique evolved and I love hand-drawn animation but I love CG as well and in many ways CG is just another tool for the animator to use and I think the best animators did make the transition to CG it took a little more effort and it took some relearning but the same principles applied so I would say that the most exciting thing about my career was coming up in the business with my peers and watching us all, we just entered the business at a great time. And it's been a fascinating journey to get to where I am today and look back and, and realize what a kind of monumental couple of times I've lived through when Little Mermaid and Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Beauty and the Beast reignited the animation business like really it had not been in years. It was in the doldrums before that. And then for that to then begat the CG era and watch what's happened since and how animation makes as much money and animated films are seen by as many people as any movie that's out there. And it's a wonderful thing to have made the right choice to get into a business at that time. You talk about John Lasseter and his role in bringing CG mm -hmm. animation to the world. Obviously, things have changed a lot. How do you think history will remember him? Well... He's still working out there, and I have huge respect for John as an artist and as an inventor and a, really a pioneer. I think he will always have that. And probably, there will probably be people who say, yeah, he was great, but he made some bad choices. In my eyes, he is a guy that changed the business I'm in, single-handedly. You've been working in CG animation for obviously a while now, and that is constantly evolving too. Was there anything you were able to do in Ugly Dolls that maybe you weren't able to do maybe even two years ago? Well, I think that two years ago, maybe a little longer than that, but the idea of doing a movie that was almost all plush animals or plush dolls was not an easy task. It never is an easy task to pull off because that's a, you know, it's a complicated thing to make it look good. Fur and all that. So, I would say that Ugly Dolls was the first time I had to deal with most of my characters having cloth or fur or terry cloth or whatever you want to call felt. All these different fabrics had to be believable looking. And I think Real Effects did an amazing job of doing that. Um, we had a lot of limitations. We were not on a Disney budget. We had things we had to cut corners. I like those limitations because it makes you creative. It makes everyone kind of put their heads together and say, okay, if we can't do this, what can we do and how can we portray this in a way that is believable 
and it's almost like a sleight of hand where make the audience think they're seeing something that is not as complicated as it might look. Those are fun times to come up with. And when that kind of creativity comes together with effects artists and animators and even the model builders and how they build the characters, all those things are things that are behind the scenes that the public doesn't get to see. But it really is, it, it makes these movies a joy to work on because I get to work with all these people that help me solve problems and I can put it in their hands and say, look, we have to get this looking right. And they will earnestly try to do their best to get it looking like we want it. And I couldn't be happier with the result on Ugly Dolls. What was it like working with your voice cast, your key actors? Well, you know, we were lucky. Every one of them were very interested in doing the movie. They liked the movie. They liked their character. Everyone came in and just had fun. And we try to make the recording sessions as fun as possible. Kelly Clarkson, as I said, she walked in and it was just her character. And she was able to just jump right into the role. And her initial takes were, some of them were still in the movie. Some of her very first takes. I mean, she just got it. I would say the same. Nick Jonas, he understood Lou in a way that I said to him, I said, you've definitely met this person. And he just kind of shook his head and yeah, I have. And he didn't really say much else, <laughs> but it was very funny. And then Pitbull, you know, we basically said, look, you're ugly dog, but you know, you're also yourself, you're Pitbull. And for him, you know, Pitbull will tell you his persona is a character that he's created. And so he just brought that to ugly dog and he decided ugly dog's alter ego was the sunglass wearing slick dog. He came up with that idea that Ugly Dog wants to be called Slick Dog, but no one takes him seriously. So that's part of his frustration. He wants to be taken seriously as a, you know, as a rapper or whatever he calls himself. And that was brought to us by Pitbull himself. That was so all of those things, each of the actors, Wanda Sykes, Gabriel Iglesias, um, BB Rexa, Charlie XEX, Lizzo, all those people who played these different roles. They really were able to buy into them and, and bring us something. No one just came in and and just gave me a non-character. We were able to key into something. And, and when they found it, we stuck with it. And it was funny. And we let them be characters. So those actors just walked in the studio and we talked a little bit. We experimented. And very quickly, they gave us something. Did you have a favorite character in Ugly Dolls? Wow. That's like picking a favorite child. I have to say... I'm not going to say it's my favorite character in Ugly Dolls, but I'm going to say I do love a good villain. And I do like a comic villain. I'm a fan of Captain Hook from Disney's Peter Pan. I'm a fan of Cruella de Vil because they're juicy, flawed, messed up villains. <laughs> and I think Nick Jonas brought us a very comic version of an overconfident character who is covering up some real deep insecurities. He just really nailed it. So I would say I like Lou as much as anyone else for that reason, because I love a good villain. <laughs> it's been great talking with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.